There is a common question often repeated among Skyrim fans. If you could somehow magically transport yourself to Skyrim, where would it be? And we love these kind of questions, as they allow us to awake our inner dreamer, even if it's for a moment. Would you prefer a life in a city or some remote farm? A life of a hunter living off the land or of a quiet bookworm spending days in a corner of some dusty library? Now, answers may vary, with some preferring pine forests of Falkrit, busy streets of Whiterun or golden autumn forests of Riften. Some would choose central tundra plains or even icy shores of Dawnstar. But there is a place that almost no one ever mentions. Mortal, including the surrounding marshes of Hjalmark. Over the years, this unlucky region became known as one of the least favorite in-game locations. And I pretty much include myself in that group. Yet here I am, talking about Mortal. Maybe it's one of those life's little mysteries, but suddenly I had the idea of Mortal Gothic and I knew that I had to make a video about it. So it made me revisit Mortal and seek for answers through its dark, misty atmosphere. Because every time I visit Mortal, I'm reminded of Halloween. Not the movie, of course. There was a feeling of uneasiness as soon as I stepped in for the first time into this town well hidden within Skyrim's enormous swamp. I would go a step further and say that Mortal was already on first sight straightforward creepy, even prior to learning all of its secrets and misfortunes. The way it stretches around the muddy, lifeless lake covered by perpetual fog and drenched into a constant droning of a dense, boreal marsh. And all those whispers of horror and tragedy that echo between the townsfolk it created, in my mind, a very unique northern gothic atmosphere. A blend between the elements of classic gothic horror and Nordic aesthetics, which I then conveniently called Mortal Gothic. But why gothic though? Perhaps all those vintage Hammer horror movies with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing that I watched years ago. They are often set in some backwater town ran by always suspecting locals, filled with creepy fog and there's always some angry mob and larger-than-life villain looming over the town like some abstract force. Mortal reminded me of those old flicks, but ultimately Mortal is a tragic city and today I will attempt to provide some answers as to why this remote location attracts so much evil. And by analyzing some of the potential causes, we will also hopefully paint the mortal gothic into a whole comprehensible narrative structure, which is ultimately goal of this video. To get there, we will have to take a closer look at the town, its inhabitants and the evil presence that lurks in the shadows. We will investigate a book, Immortal Blood, which not only provides an extraordinary piece of Tamriel's vampire lore, but also narrates a harrowing tale on one of the main characters of today's story, Movart Pikin, an ancient master vampire currently set on a dark crusade against the very town of Mortal. There can be no mortal gothic without vampires, and Movart's horrifying yet tragic life story lies in its very foundation. Mortal Gothic is, however, more than a riveting story about vampires with tragic pasts conspiring against a feverish swamp town. It also encompasses the futility and struggle of a life in the marshes of Hjalmark, its very pathos, existential isolation, insecurity and the austere lumber mill based economy, their Nordic rusticity, a symphony of purple, red and white of death bells, blood and frost, fine ingredients in the alchemical making of Mortal's gothic story. In other words, Mortal is a deeply unsettling place offering numerous secrets to those willing to uncover them. And today this is exactly what we are going to do. I hope you will enjoy the video, my name is Alec and thank you for watching.
Before we begin, let's briefly discuss the elements of horror in Skyrim. For me, there are a few genuinely scary moments in game. Although horror can range from a simple jump scare to a more complex psychological effect, so when I speak for myself, by scary moments I consider anything that made me uncomfortable or even look behind my back. I believe that the first time Skyrim weirded me out was when I casually discovered Anis's cabin at night. Although still at early stage in game, at this point I already witnessed dragons, mass destruction and burnt remains of unlucky villagers. Yet it was this old woman dressed in robe, casually sitting outside her small cabin, that introduced Skyrim's other, creepier side to me. I believe it's somehow related to archetypes, in this case of a witch in the woods, that we so often hear in children's fairy tales. So for me it's not the brutal violence, but atmosphere and storytelling that invoke sense of fear. And I always appreciate the value of atmosphere, to me it's one of the most important things when it comes to any kind of storytelling, including the horror. So like I said, for myself there are only few genuinely scary horror moments in Skyrim. And because they are so few, I find them even more rewarding. They are not there only for their shock value. And also, these moments, as much as they are rare, have the invaluable ability to transform Skyrim into a more mature, impactful experience, making me more invested in its world. The tragedy of Frostflow Lighthouse is a perfect example. It's the kind of horror that doesn't rely on jump scares, but storytelling and chilling atmosphere of a family tragedy. However, my favorite creepy Skyrim moment is the one set right here, in everyone's least favorite town of Mortal. It's, of course, related to the quest laid to rest. And while quest in itself is well written, it's also elevated through the setting of a remote town, thrown into a nightmarish cycle, creating for me one of the most memorable in-game moments. The way the story unravels gradually, through a path of one tragedy after another, each leading to something greater and unspeakable, lurking in the shadows beyond the marshes. It kept me invested from the first moment, never knowing what's going to happen next. It's almost as if the town itself lures me into a trap, and even though at some point I become aware of it, it's too late to turn back. And to me, that's the ideal horror. With that said, Mortal was one of the first places that I really wanted to leave as soon as possible. Because, as I said before, it made me feel uneasy from the moment I stepped in. And up to this day remained one of the very few locations that made me so anxious. What about Mortal made me feel that way? In the first place, it's obviously the remoteness. And not that it's the only remote town in game, but it does have this heavy, dreadful atmosphere of abandonment. It seems so far from basically everything, so vulnerable as it hides beneath a shroud of unnatural mist. It's almost always foggy or cloudy. And what's interesting, Mortal is the only town without outdoor music. There is only this weird hypnotic ambience. And then, on a rare clear day, solitude itself is revealed through a hazy horizon, offering a glimpse of almost unreachable distance, mocking the town of Mortal below, across the deadly swamp. And turning back either eastwards to Dawnstar or down to Whiterun feels equally demoralizing, because all around are high mountains, snow-swept paths and dangerous ruins filled with frost trolls, frost spiders, hungry packs of wolves and plenty of more. It's as if we are stuck here, with our feet deep into the mud, surrounded with miles of fog and death, and only thing left to do is peek into the unknown. So with a sense of defeat, because I realized that I'll have to stay mortal for a while, I began exploring. I soon found myself strolling around the mournful, desolate streets. Streets decorated with nothing but strangely alluring death bells watched only by a pair of silent moons and a couple of town guards that remind me of some lost, wandering ghosts. An eerie, unexplainable sensation suddenly chilled my very bones. I couldn't wrap my head around it, but something about the place, again, felt different. And it was only the presence of the guards with torches that made me feel somewhat safe from the unknown danger lurking from the surrounding marsh. And again, it's not like Skyrim is all innocent and timid game has a whole gallery of things to be at least creeped by. Clans of bloodthirsty vampires can be found pretty much everywhere. Growling mummified guardians of forgotten tombs, the almighty Draugr, or those super menacing looking dragon priests. 
the range and necromancers surrounded with corpses, werewolf serial killers, witches in lone cabins in the woods, overgrown spiders that flirt with my mild arachnophobia, prehistoric giant mammals that trigger some primal survival instinct within me, shady Breton merchant willing to buy my relatives. I'd even buy one of your relatives if you're looking to sell. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's a little joke. There are plenty of things to be scared of in Skyrim. But it all paled in comparison with the silence of mortal and prevailing atmosphere of hopelessness. It seemed that the town itself is left on its own. Mortal reminded me of mortality and passage of time, the insignificance of common folk frozen in the gladiatory arena of senseless civil wars, foul magics, and the world hanging on the edge of cataclysm. Could even the name Mortal be related to mortality, not only of people but the world itself? So there I was, entangled in Mortal's mystically induced hypnosis, dictated by a perpetual feverish noise of the marsh. Hjalmark embraced me with its thick fog and drowned my senses in pure northern melancholy. On every step I heard rumors of creatures lurking beyond the marshes, hints of vampires preying on hopeless victims, of strangers with hidden agendas, family tragedies, prophets and strange illnesses. Death and sadness were simply everywhere. And as I said, it's not that common for me to feel that way in Skyrim. A game that, beyond all the supposed grimness, offers plenty of breathtaking landscapes, nostalgic, almost utopian scenes of pre-modern, medieval simplicity of everyday life, perhaps occasionally peppered with bloody skirmishes, signs of decay and cultural degradation. Yes, but otherwise, Skyrim was, and let's all agree on that, supposed to be this ideal Nordic Arcadia imbued with a bit of old western frontier-like individualism, waiting to be explored and thoroughly enjoyed. It never goes too far, it's not supposed to. Never too dark or too scary. And even in the face of danger, no matter what it be, we are the hero, the voice-wielding last dragonborn. We are the one left standing, walking away victoriously into the sunset. That's how the stories are supposed to end. Not immortal, though. Town wrapped in such tragic aura left my character permanently scarred even after undoing all the wrongs. And honestly, I attribute this to effective writing. It may not be a popular thing to say, but I think that Mortal's overall story arc is one of the more memorable ones. I guess tragedy cuts deep and Mortal is the essence of tragedy. It might not be the best looking city, it might not offer the best services, or have fun characters ready to indulge in casual conversation. It's not built on some epic inspiring location. In fact, it's far from any of that, and that might be its charm. Mortal may as well be considered anti-town, as if it emerged from the swampy underground to offer us a glimpse of the other, dark side of life. Because of the lowlands, fog, water and deep purple flowers, Mortal has this distinguishing tonic nature. To even enter the town, we follow the path downwards descending from the main road, again as if we are descending into the underworld, realm of shadows, and on the horizon celestial towers of solitude stretch far high as if belonging to the skies, reaffirming the deep earthy character of mortal. With that said, I was always a fan of stories involving small, underappreciated towns, shrouded in mystery, suspense and tragedy. Mortal obviously fits this category perfectly, and adding all the intricate layers of horror over it, we have ourselves a true mortal gothic story. Mortal wouldn't be mortal without its faithful companion, the all-surrounding Drykmir Marsh. This immense saltwater marsh is a source of many legends that naturally form the core of Mortal's somber folklore. It is not only implied that people regularly disappear beyond Drykmir's eternal mist, but it's in a way accepted as being part of a daily life perhaps even undertaking a form of mortal's collective unconscious ritual, a ritual of offering. It is accepted and given that some will have to be taken by the marsh. One of the oldest legends that speaks of this is of the Pale Lady, a Wisp Mother. For generations, the people of Mortal have told whispered tales of the Pale Lady, a ghostly woman who wanders the northern marshes, forever seeking her lost daughter. 
Some say she steals children who wander astray, others that her sobbing wail strikes dead all those who hear it. But behind these tales may lie a kernel of truth, for ancient records speak of Aumriel, a mysterious figure Iskramor's hair battled for decades and finally sealed away. Wisp mothers are sirens of the northern marshes, ethereal, ghostly apparitions who lure unsuspecting travelers to their doom and steal children who stray away from home. Pale Lady or Aumriel is indeed found in game to the east of Mortal, sealed within the Frostmere crypt, possibly built by Atmorans for this specific reason. Now, scholarly opinion on the Wisp Mothers is divided. A book, The Wisp Mother, offers few possible explanations of their origin. Some consider them to be remains of ancient Falmer sorcerers who once ruled Skyrim, or types of lichdom attained by the necromancers of the First Era cultures. And there are even theories that categorize Wisp Mothers as elemental beings, akin to ice rats or spriggans, manifestations arising out of Nern itself. Whatever may be, an image of these ancient ghosts of sorrow wandering through the mists surrounding Mortal is definitely one of my favorite Mortal Gothic elements. There are, however, more dangers lurking in Dreykmir. Human hunting frost spiders crawling beneath the twisted branches of dead trees, hiding in thorny bushes ever so patiently. Serpentine ice rats descending from the frozen mountain peaks, hovering and twisting above red, muddy waters. And even the poisonous, mostly cave-dwelling Chorus seems to feel at home here. To my knowledge, this is the only open land area where Chorus can be encountered, as they prefer darker and deeper habitats. One of the symbols of Mortal and Hjalmark is a death bell flower. Common in swampy areas, this plant is one of the very few reasons to step into the dangerous marsh. Many daring alchemists seek death bell for their potent poisonous effects but very few manage to return alive. Herbalist's Guide to Skyrim has this to say. Folklore abounds about this flower, found in the swamps of Hjalmark. Some stories claim it grows where unfortunate deaths have taken place. Others insist it grows first and then lures unsuspecting people and animals to their doom. All things considered, that bell truly found its place among the symbols of mortal. It's honestly one of my favorite flowers in Skyrim, at least design-wise. I kinda prefer deep blue and purple plants that contrast snow-covered Skyrim. But with that said, let's take a look at some of the characters living in Mortal. I won't go through every single one, but I will attempt to cover those I consider to be the most relevant for the narrative of Mortal Gothic. Meet Jorgen, a brooding Nord lumberjack who runs the only mill in Mortal. He goes through the days caring only about his mill and wife Lammy. He is part of the mob standing outside the High Moon Hall upon arriving to Mortal. In many ways, Jorgen embodies the ideal minor character, seemingly has nothing to offer, has nowhere to go, and lives in a never-ending cycle of labor and rumination. Jorgen will provide the player with plenty of information on Mortal in just about few lines of dialogue. The mill is my responsibility, and that's what I care about, that's all, understand? Trust you saw the house that burned down. Peculiar bit of business that was. And that's on top of noises from the marsh in the night, tales of monsters, and now this wizard in our mist. What's a man to do if he can't look to his yar for help? A rumor about the recently burned house, tales of monsters in the marsh, express his negative disposition towards the recently arrived wizard and Jarl's inability to control the situation. Jorgen's pragmatic mindset seeks simple answers to problems he, for the most part, doesn't even comprehend. He, as expected, doesn't trust outsiders and wants to be left alone within his micro-universe centered around the lumber mill. Except he does have a secret, which is revealed to us only later. Jorgen is the bearer of the hilt of Mehrun's razor, which has been in possession of his family, Clan X bearer, for eight generations. It's such a fun throwback to the events of the previous title Oblivion, 
and a wonderful example of the ever-fluctuating nature of life injected into the virtual world of Elder Scrolls, Jorgen is only one of the descendants of the inner circle of the little-known order called the Keepers of the Razor, originally a militant group that fought Mythic Dawn 200 years ago and which took into possession the infamous Daedric Blade. This information added so much depth into an otherwise insignificant character and with that also provided Mortal with another layer of secrecy. Or what about Benoar, a muscle-bound Nord warrior whose days consist of childlike daydreaming about becoming the town's guard, while reclining on bridge for most of the time? There has to be a reason why he isn't accepted yet, since I doubt the guardsmen of Mortal set such a high standard. He's a self-proclaimed best brawler in Mortal, childishly challenging a player to a fight. Plenty of such characters in Skyrim, of course, brute, honest and naive in their simplicity. Huh? As soon as we arrive in Mortal, we will hear whispers about the burned house down at the edge of the town. It's Mortal's biggest rumor, a terrible tragedy that befell Mortal and serves as an introduction into a dark and twisted questline known as Late Rest. It begins as a family tragedy, extremely sad but without suspicion of any supernatural involvement. A mother and a child named Helgi were killed in the fire, while Helgi's father, Hrogar, survived, as he could be seen still working around the mill. However, the unusual part is that Hrogar immediately moved into another woman's home, and by that I mean literally next day. Let's hear what Yona, Mortal's innkeeper, has to say about that. Hrogar's house? It burned down not too long ago. It's a real pity about his wife and kid. The screams woke half the town. Most folk won't go near it now for fear it's cursed. Hrogar claims it was a hearth fire. Some folks say Hrogar started it himself. See, he's living with Alva now. That started the day after the fire. It ain't right moving in with a new love the day after your kin die like that. We also learn that Jarl Idgrod is ready to pay for any information regarding the incident. Hrogar will mostly act as if nothing happened. If asked about the burned house, he has this to say. That's true, but I'm in a new house now, a better house. But what about your wife and child? Yeah, that was a shame. But now Alva takes care of me and I take care of her. Yeah, that was a shame. In other words, Hrogar moved on pretty quickly and doesn't seem to miss his tragically lost family. Which is why, as we heard from Yona, some suspect that he's the one who started the fire, just so he can be with Alva, his new girlfriend. Tonir is another lumberjack working at Jorgen's mill and self-confessed poor man trying to make a living. He is quiet and can be often seen staring into the foggy distance, lost in thoughts. As it turns out, his wife Lelet is yet one of the latest people to have disappeared from Mortal, and he suspects that she in fact abandoned him and their son in order to join Stormcloak Rebellion. At least this is what Alva told him, and that of course turned out to be not true at all, as we shall see later. But I think that was enough to draw some conclusions regarding the local commoners. Characters of Mortal are miserable and stick to themselves as if burdened by the existential insignificance. There's no value except maintaining the cycle of eternal return. Day after day, the same swing of the axe, same song in the tavern, same fantasy revisited, same painful emotion experienced. As long as the dream continues, life goes on towards the unknown. As we dialogue with various inhabitants, we are unwillingly pulled into their small town nihilistic bubble. Yet, Jorgen's or Benoit's trivial reflections are only sketching a rough outline of Mortal's true anguish and serve as mere entry into the town's more intricate passages of character studies. So, life has brought you to Morthal and to me. What purpose this serves we will no doubt see. Let's pay a visit to Jarl Idgrod Ravencrown. Naturally, this aged ruler of Hjalmark is at the epicenter of all turbulences occurring in Mortal. The mob seen as we enter the town for the first time is eager to confront the Jarl regarding her inability to properly run the hold, prevented only by her protective and much younger husband, Asulfur. The people still doubt me, don't they? No, not at all. It's just... It does not surprise me. 
They do not share in what I see, and I cannot explain it to them. Just guide them well, and all will work out. I have never doubted that, husband. Jarl Idgrod is a character shrouded in mystery and does in many ways personifies Mortal itself. On one hand, she seems to lead this wise politics of neutrality, apparently taking no sides in the ongoing civil war, as to not draw Mortal further down the pit of destruction, although her loyalty ultimately remains with the Empire. Yet her main trait is mysticism, which is a true reason for her indifference towards daily politics. Mysticism is of course a highly dangerous craft, often greatly misunderstood among the more simple and pragmatic minds of Skyrim. I'll be honest, Idgrod always kinda creeped me out. She has this hag raven like outline, and being titled Ravencrone only reinforces her obviously intentional image of a witch, or a hag. In folklore, Crone is an ugly old woman, usually malicious, similarly to Slavic meaning of Baba and in some traditions marks the archetype of a wise woman or a hag. Thus, I wonder if there is any substantial relation between Idgrod Ravencron and hag ravens, those feathery bestial witches, especially when their land, the Reach, isn't that far from mortal. Adding to Jarl Idgrod's mysterious origin story, there's a rather peculiar line in the official strategy guide about her wanderings through Tamriel in the younger years in search for wisdom, from which she returned, quote, touched. It is given in the form of a rumor, especially about her apparent change, so we are once again left with more questions. Idgrod is in fact submerged into her own pocket dream realm, similar to other townsfolk. Imbued with mystic fantasies and loose, never too specific prophecies. Is her psychic gift even real or is it perhaps only a soul sickness? falsely interpreted as a divine touch, it's never too clear and it shouldn't be. Although Elder Scrolls games regularly portray characters born with the gift of psychic foresight, so it's not too hard to accept her visions as real, although quite unclear. However, the thing with the Idgrods, or however they're called, is that, that the supposed mystical psychic gift or curse runs in blood. It is genetic. Jarl Idgrod's children, Idgrod the Younger, Basically, an adult woman and surprisingly young boy Yorick share same mystical affinities, although Yorick seems to be suffering the most. With all of that aside, it's safe to say that Jarl Idgrod's old age and tendency to speak in riddles and rely on visions instead on people around her forces local residents to lose trust in her leadership, with even her housecarl, Gorm, otherwise a faithful protector, actively plotting to remove her. Nords prefer straight-in-your-face talk, and especially in these harsh times, it's not surprising that they require a strong, capable and more active leader. Again, Mortal is a deeply troubled city and having an odd, mystic hag as a Jarl only deepens the overall chaos. Idgrod the Younger is basically a younger, innocent version of Idgrod the Older. She also suffers visions, but to a lesser extent, and is preparing to one day inherit the throne. However, for now, her only task, it seems, is to take care of Yorick. Her age is not quite given, but regardless, her character has a definite childlike innocence and passiveness. She hopes to be as good as her mother, even though entire town is basically plotting to overthrow her. Yorick is the magic child. He will comment the player with following words. You're different, aren't you? Not like anyone else, not in Morthal or Skyrim. Implying that he knows, or at least senses, player's uniqueness of being the Dragonborn. At another time, it's even implied that he can read minds. Gorm thinks I'm mad. He doesn't say it, but I know he thinks it. Is he right? Not even Jarl Idgrod is capable of this. But what's even more strange is that he believes Falion, local wizard, is behind his visions, even calling up his name in dreams. And speaking of dreams, visions and children, there are a few other examples in Skyrim where children seem to have strong prophetic abilities. Only in Mortal there is also Agni, Falion's adopted daughter and apprentice, who shares unusual dreams. And then there is Cicel in Rorikstad who dreamed a good grey dragon, which most believe to be Partonax. But going back to Yorick just for a bit, Yorick is otherwise seen every day running around with other children, constantly watched over by his sister due to his habit to wander away. He is frequently lost in visions and according to his own words isn't here as to here in this reality, prompting rumors of his insanity. 
It will be interesting to see what the future holds for Yorick, if he is going to one day even become a Jarl and learn to control his visions. Mortal's resident with the most secretive background is none arguably Thalion, a Redguard master conjurer claiming to be Mortal's silent protector. Actually, it's not so much his background that is unknown, as are his motives for coming to this forsaken remote town that, I'd say rightfully, raise quite a few eyebrows. It's not uncommon to regard Falion as one of the most skilled magic users in all of Skyrim, especially among all the court wizards. He, after all, serves under Jarl Idgrod, who is a mystic herself. Falion, as expected, appears to be a step above other residents in terms of understanding the nature of threat looming over Mortal, but he never really does anything to prevent it. Even when we are about to finally confront Mortal's main antagonist, he doesn't take active role or at least offers an advice. So the question arises, is Falion even aware of the ongoing vampire threat? And when it is finally revealed that Falion is, ironically, the only in-game character capable of curing vampirism, his presence in the vampire-infested mortal does seem more than coincidental. Falion is definitely drawn to mortal by an unknown force pursuing a goal known only to him. As previously mentioned, he makes sure to let us know of his status of a town's misunderstood guardian, but it's never clear against whom or what. Morthal is a troubled place, and it's my duty to see it rest in peace. We only, and quite logically, suspect that it's against the nearby vampires. As Master Conjurer, Falion used to teach at the College of Winterhold, before his unexpected move to Mortal, in order to pursue a more private and discreet arcane studies. After each midnight, he sneaks out and wanders into the marsh, even though he constantly warns others of remaining indoors at night. He then visits the mysterious ritual site near Mortal, performing unknown rites. It's the same site where he performs the ritual of removing vampirism. Naturally, this odd nocturnal activity inspired a number of theories on Falion, from him being a necromancer, a danger worshipper, to even being a vampire himself. He in fact admits to have considered becoming a vampire at one point in life. He obviously shares a certain admiration to not only vampires, but to the let's say darker and less understood spheres of life. Conjurers are often viewed as existing on the very edge of cultural and societal acceptance, at least in these parts of Tamriel, as conjuration is effectively often confused with necromancy. Falion's unusual undefined placement within Mortal's storyline, to me however, only adds to the overall mystique. Is he a friend or a foe? A child eater, as some townsfolk seem to suspect, or a grim but ultimately benevolent figure that watches over Mortal from the same shadows as the evil he is supposedly crusading against? To make things for Falion even more difficult, he adopted an orphan girl named Agni, training her on daily basis to become his apprentice. Falion's and Agnes' relation in many ways is reminiscent of that between Juan and Cicel in Rorikstad. Some possible further analogies between Mortal and Rorikstad will be touched upon later. However, while here I'd like to briefly discuss the importance of the role of children in the overall narrative. You see, at the heart of Mortal's darkness, as it's already mentioned, lies the tragedy of a burned, cursed house. Investigating the strange events that happened prior and just after the tragic incident, we will trigger the beginning of the notorious questline laid to rest, as we are sent to investigate the remains of the house. There, among the ashes, we meet a chilling specter of a young girl, Helgi, who died in the fire. I will speak for myself when I say that witnessing the ghost of a child turned the whole narrative into something far more sinister. Children in Skyrim have this very unique status. They are essential and unkillable, for many obvious reasons. Keeping Skyrim relatively family-friendly. Yes, there are world-ending dragons, a brotherhood of assassins, worshipping an abstract demonic entity that communicates through a mummified remains of a woman and whatnot, but children are safely nested outside any danger through careful game mechanics. Remember when I said that there are few truly horrifying moments in Skyrim, and because of that they are much more rewarding? Same goes for Skyrim's children. There are very few moments when we are faced with their own mortality, and those moments are really effective. Examples that I can remember right off the bat is that werewolf serial killer in Falkreath, or again, the Frostflow lighthouse, and this one right here in Mortal. Again, these moments are truly rare, but even so, successfully add to Skyrim that always needed weight of grim realism. The people here work so hard, and they never allow themselves a moment of fun. 
It's such a pity. It won't last forever, though. Now, let's take a look at Town's antagonist, a local femme fatale. Alva is one of the key figures and serves as a primal antagonist in the town of Mortal. In fact, it's impossible to analyze her character without mentioning her master, Movart, and his grand plan. Alva is a Nord vampire, turned by Movart himself, as described in her journal. My life is dreary. Where is my prince come to rescue me? Where is my bold Nord warrior to sweep me off my feet? I met a man today when picking night flowers. He is exciting and exotic. We kissed in the moonlight. It was so romantic. I'm going to see him again tonight. Released from the chains of life of perpetual boredom, Aloha quickly embraces her new unlife. Now I understand the true color of the night. Movard has shown me the true black of night and the true red of blood. He has promised me a feast of blood if I do his bidding in mortal. Movart's unholy plan is finally revealed. Alva is sent on a quest of seducing and enthralling the men of Mortal, especially guards. These people are like cattle. All they do is work, sleep, and eat. Her first victim was Hrogar, who became her troll and protector of her coffin. She comments. Hrogar was easy to seduce. Movart said I should find a protector first, someone to watch over my coffin during the day. Hrogar is perfect. Laylette came to visit me tonight. She slaked my thirst. I've hidden her away to let her rise as my handmaiden. I've spread the rumor in town that she left to join the war. Fools. Laylette is, as previously mentioned, Tonir's wife. It's unclear what was her relation to Alva prior to becoming a vampire, but it seems that they shared certain connection. Alva have chosen Laylette as her handmaiden, a personal servant, reflecting Alva's not-so-humble ambitions expecting probably a high status within the Movart's coven. Following line in her journal finally reveals Movart's endgame. Movart has confined his grand plan to me. I am to seduce the guardsmen, one at a time, and make them my slaves. Is there something I can do for you? Then he and the others from the coven can descend upon Mortal and take the entire town. We won't kill them. They will become cattle for our thirst an endless supply of blood and an entire town to protect us from the cursed sun. I will discuss the character of Mowart separately in the next chapter, so I won't analyze details of his grand plan here. Final part of Alva's journal talks about the burning of Hrogar's house, providing us with a complete explanation of what exactly happened. Hrogar's family is becoming inconvenient. I've told Lelet to kill them all, but make it look like an accident. Rogar must be seen as innocent if he's going to be my protector. That little fool, Lelet burned Hrogar's family alive. I asked for an accident and she gave me a scandal. To make matters worse, she tried to turn his little girl, Helgi. Except Lelet couldn't even do that right. She killed the child and left the body to burn. Something is wrong with Lelet. She keeps talking about Helgi. I think her mind has snapped. She seems to think that the child can still be brought back to be her companion. There is a stranger in town looking into the fire. I'll have to be careful. Alva is that character in every vampire story who not only willingly embraces vampirism, but pretty much brags about it in front of the unsuspecting people. The people here work so hard, and they never allow themselves a moment of fun. It's such a pity. It won't last forever, though. Why, good evening, young. What can I get you, Alva? What can't you get me, sweetie? Um, did you want something to eat? Eat? No, I don't think I'm hungry. Not now, at least. Right, okay. Uh, tell me if you change your mind. As a way of mocking them, just how would a highly dangerous predator mock its prey before the onslaught? I hardly doubt that vampirism drastically changed her character and opinion of others. She regards people of mortal, and possibly people in general, as mere cattle, in literal sense as her food, but also as slaves to the never-ending cycle of work and sleep, which she always found utterly monotonous and uninspiring.
Alva was caught picking night flowers in the middle of the night, as if almost inviting a sinister force through this unusual nocturnal activity. More specifically, a vampire to take her away. This night flower is almost certainly nightshade, a highly poisonous flower that commonly grows around graveyards and is generally avoided by common folk. Lelette, who was supposed to be Alva's handmaiden, couldn't handle vampirism in the same manner as Alva. When ordered to kill Helgi and her unnamed mother, she burned the entire house, causing all kinds of rumors and attracting even more attention. At the sight of Helgi, who was about to die in the fire, something snapped within Lelette, and she became obsessed with the child, possibly even out of regret, so she tried to turn her into a vampire. However, it was too late, and Helgi died soon after. And finally, we have little Helgi, perhaps the most tragic character in the entire storyline. We encounter her as a ghost, standing in the corner of her former home. When asked what happened on that tragic night, she will answer with this chilling reply. The smoke woke me up. I was hot and I was scared, so I hid. Then it got cold and dark. I'm not scared anymore. But I'm lonely. Will you play with me? She then invites us to play hide and seek, in exchange for information of who set the fire. Okay, let's play hide and seek. You find me, and I'll tell you. We have to wait for nighttime, though. The other one is playing too, and she can't come out until then. Helgi mentions the mysterious other female who also wants to play, but who can't get out till the nighttime. We are to find Helgi before the mysterious figure. And to find Helgi, we need to visit her grave, located not far behind the house. However, there will be someone else as well. This is, of course, a mysterious figure who also wants to play. And it is Lelet, a first vampire encountered in Mortal, standing next to Helgi's undug grave, apparently still believing that a child will arise as her companion. Lelet seems to have been completely insane at this point, probably caused by guilt, especially for taking young girl's life. I always found ghosts or spirits of Elder Scrolls, and especially in Skyrim, somewhat strange, even a bit eerie. They seem to occupy a thin line between the worlds of the living and dead, a liminal space through which they seem to be partially aware of their surroundings. For instance, Helgi will sense our presence in the house, but she won't know who we are exactly. Majority of ghosts encountered in Skyrim are here due to some unfinished business. It's a standard fantasy or a horror trope, so to speak. Helgi also mentions being tired, and it's believed that ghosts in general do feel uncomfortable in the world of living. Helgi's constant tiredness could mean that her soul is being pulled away into Aetherius. However, she is kept here, in Mortal, by some unknown force. So, speaking to ghost characters always felt to me like speaking to dream images of their original living selves. They do have a dreamlike quality, being half aware, drifting through memories and world around them, as if they are guided by some invisible divine hand. Discovering Helgi for the second time at her own grave will lead to confirmation that Lelette was truly forced against her will to burn down the house and kill Helgi and her mother, which is why she tried to save Helgi by turning her into a vampire as well. She's dead, he's speared. Tonir will suddenly arrive at the scene, implying that he most likely patrols around Mortal each night in search for his wife. He will obviously be shocked to see Lelet as a vampire and will eventually point us towards Awa as the main suspect. I never got to tell her goodbye. We are then left to break inside Alva's house and search for Clue, which will trigger a hostile encounter with both her and Hrogar. I already talked about Alva's journal found inside her ceremoniously placed coffin. I think it also speaks about her total acceptance and embrace of vampirism. Most vampires will probably prefer a more secretive or a discreet layout, but in Alva's case she placed her coffin at the very center of the basement, surrounded by candles. It all looks very official, as Alva obviously takes lots of pride in her new, undead version of self. Again, I have an impression that she imagined herself as some future vampiric bride or princess. In any case, upon discovering the latter, Jarl Idgrod will make a very funny comment on Alva. Traitorous bitch. 
Morthal owes you a debt. And gather a group of able-bodied warriors to help us clear Morvat's lair. I always liked the scene of a mob waiting to lynch the main vampire. It's reminiscing of classic horror movies, has a very strong gothic feel to it, and it even adds with a comedic effect. Oh, this place looks dangerous. Yeah, kinda scary too. And it's full of vampires? Cowards! We must kill the vampires! We have to make them pay! Of course! But why not let him go in first? Out of all able-bodied warriors, only one brave enough to follow us inside the Morvat's lair will be Tonir. Although I usually let him stay outside. It's a nice example of character development after witnessing the cowardice from the rest of the characters. Not surprisingly though, the entrance to Morvat's lair looks pretty scary. And it's not like Tonir has nothing to lose. He may have lost his wife to Mowart, but he still has a son back in town. The rest of the quest is pretty straightforward, we enter the lair and clear it out. The ultimate reward awaits us once we reach lair's exit, as Ghost of Helgi appears for the last time, thanking us for making her and her mother feel better. Mother's calling me. It's time for me to sleep now. I'm so tired. Thank you for making her feel better. Helgi's burdened soul is finally free to ascend after we slay the mighty Morvat Pikin. And this is of course the end of the quest laid to rest. However, now is the time to take a closer look at the main antagonist, Mortal's master villain, Morvart Picken, who, as we soon gonna find out, holds a very interesting and equally tragic story, as told in the book Immortal Blood. Immortal Blood is authored by Anonymous Vampire and narrates a story of famous vampire hunter Morvat. It's honestly one of my favorite books and there's no better way to start the analysis of Morvat Picken than reading the full story. The moons and stars were hidden from sight, making that particular quiet night especially dark. The town guard had to carry torches to make their rounds, but the man who came to call at my chapel carried no light with him. I came to learn that Mowart Pickin could see in the dark almost as well as the light. An excellent talent, considering his interests were exclusively nocturnal. One of my acolytes brought him to me, and from the look of him, I at first thought that he was in need of healing. He was pale to the point of opalescence, with a face that looked like it had once been very handsome, before some unspeakable suffering. The dark circles under his eyes bespoke exhaustion, but the eyes themselves were alert, intense, almost insane. He quickly dismissed my notion that he himself was ill, though he did want to discuss a specific disease. Vampirism, he said, and then paused at my quizzical look. I was told that you were someone I should seek out for help understanding it. Who told you that? I asked with a smile. Ticina Gray. I immediately remembered her. A brave, beautiful knight who had needed my assistance separating facts from fiction on the subject of vampire. It had been two years and I had never heard whether my advice had proved effective. You've spoken to her. How is her ladyship? I asked. Dead, Movart replied coldly. And then, responding to my shock, he added to perhaps soften the blow. She said your advice was invaluable, at least for the one vampire. When last I talked to her, she was tracking another. It killed her. Then the advice I gave her was not enough. I sighed. Why do you think it would be enough for you? I was a teacher once myself years ago, he said. Not in a university. A trainer in the fighters guild. But I know that if a student doesn't ask the right questions, the teacher cannot be responsible for his failure. I tend to ask you the right questions. 
and that he did. For hours he asked questions and I answered what I could. But he never volunteered any information by himself. He never smiled. He only studied me with those intense eyes of his, committing every word I said to memory. Finally, I turned the questioning around. You said you were a trainer at a fighter's guild. Are you on assignment for them? No, he said curtly, and finally I could detect some wariness in those feverish eyes of his. I would like to continue this tomorrow night, if I could. I need to get some sleep and absorb this. You sleep during the day? I smiled. To my surprise, he returned the smile, though it was more of a grimace. When tracking your prey, you adapt their habits. The next day, he did return with more questions. These ones were very specific. He wanted to know about the vampires of Eastern Skyrim. I told him about the most powerful tribe, the Volkihar clan. Paranoid and cruel, whose very breath could freeze their victims' blood in their veins. I explained to him that they lived beneath the ice of remote and haunted lakes, never venturing into the world of men except to feed. Movart Pickin listened carefully and asked more questions into the night, until at last he was ready to leave. I will not see you for a few days, he said, but I will return and tell you how helpful your information has been. True to his word, the man returned to my chapel shortly after midnight, four days later. There was a fresh scar on his cheek, but he was smiling that grim but satisfied smile of his. Your advice helped me very much, he said, but you should know that the Volkihar have an additional ability you didn't mention. They can reach through ice of their lakes without breaking it. It was quite a nasty surprise, being grabbed from below without any warning. How remarkable, I said with a laugh. And terrifying. You are lucky you survived. I don't believe in luck. I believe in knowledge and training. Your information helped me and my skill at melee combat sealed the bloodsucker's fate. I have never believed in weaponry of any kind. Too many unknowns. Even the best swordsmith has created a flawed blade. But you know what your body is capable of. I know I can land a thousand blows without losing my balance, provided I get the first strike. The first strike? I murmured. So you must never be surprised. That is why I came to you, said Mowart. You know more than anyone alive about these monsters, in all their cursed varieties across the land. Now you must tell me more about the vampires of Northern Valenwood. I did as he asked, and once again his questions taxed my knowledge. There were many tribes to cover. The Bonsamu, who were indistinguishable from Bosmer except when seen by candlelight. The Kirilt who could disintegrate into mist, the Yekev, who swallowed men whole, the dread Talbot, who preyed on children eventually taking their place in the family, waiting patiently for years before murdering them all in their unnatural hunger. Once again he bade me farewell, promising to return in few weeks, and once again he returned as he said, just after midnight. This time Mowart had no fresh scars, but he again had new information. You were wrong about the Kinneret being unable to vaporize when pushed underwater, he said, patting my shoulder fondly. Fortunately, they cannot travel far in their mist form, and I was able to track it down. It must have surprised it fearfully. Your field knowledge is becoming impressive, I said. I should have had an acolyte like you decades ago. Now tell me, he said, of vampires of Cyrodiil. I told him what I could. There was but one tribe in Cyrodiil, a powerful clan, who had ousted all other competitors, much like the Imperials themselves had done. Their true name was unknown, lost in history, but they were experts of concealment. If they kept themselves well fed, they were indistinguishable from a living person. They were cultured, more civilized than the vampires of the provinces, preferring to feed on victims while they were asleep, unaware. They will be difficult to surprise. Mowart frowned, but I will seek one out and tell you what I learn, and then you will tell me of the vampires of High Rock and Hammerfell and elsewhere and Black Marsh and Morrowind and the Somerset Isles, yes? I nodded, knowing then that this was a man on an eternal quest. He wouldn't be satisfied with but the barest hint of how things were. He needed to know it all. He did not return for a month. And on the night that he did, 
I could see his frustration and despair, though there were no lights burning in my chapel. I failed, he said, as I lit a candle. You were right, I could not find a single one. I brought a light up to my face and smiled. He was surprised, even stunned by the pallor of my flesh, the dark hunger in my ageless eyes, and the teeth. Oh yes, I think the teeth definitely surprised a man who could not afford to be surprised. I haven't fed in 72 hours, I explained, as I fell on him. He did not land the first blow or the last. Judging from his name, Mowart Pikin is a Breton. Vanilla Skyrim prior to Dawnguard made him as a randomized character, similar to some other named boss enemies. Krav the Skinner, leader of Silver Hands, comes to mind. This was probably another discrepancy by Bethesda, kinda fixed with the Dawnguard, which gave Mowart a fixed race, although he was made a Nord instead. The story of Immortal Blood is really fascinating to me, but if we focus only on Morward's character, what strikes me as unusual is that even prior to him becoming a vampire, he displayed a wide range of vampire-like abilities or traits. He could see in the dark, he was very pale, slept during the day, and performed all activities during the night, and so on. We never learn why is Morvat exactly on this quest of hunting all the vampires across Tamriel. He looks to be troubled by something from the past perhaps losing a family member to a vampire. Some highly traumatizing event had to trigger his fanatical determination. His motives remain hidden, but we get a picture of someone who is so obsessed with the vampires that almost becomes a distorted mirror image of them. He is not a vampire, but his pale, sickly appearance has definite vampiric characteristics. With that said, his unique skill set made him a very efficient vampire slayer, touring all across Tamriel in a never-ending crusade to exterminate all of them, until he was turned into a vampire by a mysterious priest. There is also a question of what is Morwat doing in Mortal, out of all places. Numerous theories arose throughout the years, from suggesting that he isn't even the real, original Morwat, but an imposter pretending to be this legendary master vampire. This assumption is pretty much based on the fact that Morwat in the game originally could be almost any race, and doesn't really offer that much challenge combat-wise, especially after being described as an exceptional fighter and also because of this specific line from Jarl Idgrod. The journal mentions Movarth, a master vampire I thought was destroyed a century ago. However, I think that the character we encounter in game is the real Movarth. As already mentioned, his racial background is fixed with the DLC, although it's set as a Nord and not a Breton. As for him being too easy to defeat, players sometimes forget that the power level of many in-game characters especially enemies and creatures, is scaled down for gaming purposes. And this also goes for magic and artifacts. And we play as, safe to say, probably most powerful mortal in all of Tamriel, who is also able to abuse all the game mechanics. As for the Idgrod's line, I think it's just a way to portray Mowart's legendary status. His legend could be around for not only centuries, but perhaps over a millennia. And people would naturally assume or hope for Mowart's death. He could even spread those rumors himself, trying to maintain his secrecy. As to why is he immortal, my impression is that Mowart is immortal for the same reason we find Falion there and all the surrounding necromancers, like the one in the nearby fort Snowhawk. As Jarl Idgrod says in one of her lines, the spirit world is strong in this place. In other words, Mortal seems to be a place where the veil between the worlds is especially thin, attracting all sorts of beings and characters, with developed senses for magic. Magical currents run wild throughout Hjalmark, drawing in those who wish to use them, for good or evil. Running an inn weren't my plan, but Falian decided to move here, so I joined him. Movart met his second and final death in the marshes of Mortal. I'm pretty sure that at this point he was a totally different person than the one we read about in Immortal Blood. Even if he at first tried to control the bloodlust and deny to some extent vampiric nature, he would eventually succumb to it. Mowart we met in that cave was but the darkest shadow of Mowart the Pale Vampire Hunter. And why I find the end of Late Rest quest so rewarding. We don't only release Helgi's spirit into Aetherius, 
but end Mowart's millennial agony of being in undead, something that he truly hated the most during life. So far, we concluded that Mortal is strong with spirits and is surrounded by a specifically strong mystic aura. This is confirmed by both ambiental storytelling and in-game characters like Falion and Jarl Idgrod. I had a bad dream again last night. Oh? I dreamt that you went away. You made monsters. It's just a dream, child. Nothing more. It was scary. It was like it was real. Hush now. Think no more of it. With both of them being mystics with abilities to sense the otherworldly energies. The source of Martal's mystical aura could be the swamp itself, or perhaps even a cart river flowing from the reach, carrying in its waters traces of the hidden magic practiced in those lands. Cart River flows from the Alps of the Druadak Mountains, which separate Skyrim from High Rock and Hammerfall. These mountains are home to rich men, who practice some form of wild magic or witchcraft, which is, at times, very dark in nature. I've already mentioned hag ravens who are holding something of a central role in these cults. Now, Cart River flows into the Sea of Ghosts, near Solitude, but it creates the Cart Delta and the Drykmir Marsh. River Hjal, which dominates Hjalmark, flows northward of Mortal and drains into the same Cart Delta. And, while Solitude is lifted above the marshes, Mortal is essentially a part of Drykmir, directly connected with the soil and waters, and thus, unlike Solitude, could be affected with any energies or unnatural elements embedded in them. At least, this is one of the theories behind Mortal's troubled nature. I've also spoken a bit about the symbolism of the marshes and swamps, and how they often represent the unknown, dangerous or even mystical. Laying outside the orderly world, marshes are liminal spaces, inhabited by druids, alchemists, necromancers, outcasts in general. Regular people tend to stay away from them. At the very beginning, I mentioned that mortal remind me of Halloween. Halloween is that time of the year when the veil between the world of the living and the world of the spirits is at its weakest point. And coming from Europe, I can say that many European old religions and traditions also talk about the physical locations that serve as gateways into the spirit realm. And then, it could also be that the locals hold some secret. We all know about the Rorikstad conspiracy, one of my favorite Skyrim conspiracies, by the way, which, in short, claims that local farmers made a deal with the Daedra in return for a plentiful harvest. Interestingly enough, Rorikstad is also relatively close to the rich men and hag ravens. Could it be that Mortal as well hold a similar dark secret, although in its case, not as beneficial? There are even talks about Mortal having originally more content before being cut by Bethesda. We all know that Skyrim has a ton of cut content, some of it being even restored by modders. Some believe that Mortal was supposed to have a larger, more impactful role, with perhaps even Dawnguard involvement and Morwat being the main villain. I don't generally agree with this, but I wanted to lay it out because it does sound interesting. With that said, Mortal offers undeniably unique and creepy Skyrim experience, and we can only speculate and theorize what's truly lying behind it. Cold, misty marshes will always be the domain of weird and natural folklore, and Mortal has the misfortune of being located in one such place. With that said, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you soon. You there. The Dawn Guard is looking for anyone willing to fight against the growing vampire menace. What do you say? What do you need, handsome? Huh?